Uh, do you know any good jokes? Good jokes? Or no. just jokes? I know terrible, <laughs> terrible jokes. Cool. Um, yeah, Joy, thank you. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And okay. um, welcome to the second episode of Linguistically Aware, um, a spoken word program in which we talk about the use of language in all walks of life, in all sphere, spheres of life. Um, you are a conlanger and the president of the Language Creation Society. I would like to start with that. Who is a conlanger and uh, what is a language creation society? Um, it's some of the most challenging questions to answer is exactly what is a conlanger, who is a conlanger, uh, because I, I don't think there's one mold that really captures everyone. Um, so a, a conlang is just the, um, it, it's a language who was, that was perfect, perfectly, purposely created by one or more individuals for whatever that goal happens to be. And a conlanger is just someone who engages in the art and science of conlanging. Um, and why someone might do that is there's so many reasons. Uh, a lot of people do it for um, film, television, books, uh, tabletop role-playing games, and it's it's to add verisimilitude to the world they're trying to create. Other people do it as a refuge to create their own personal language, um, to express what they, they have trouble expressing through their, their mother tongue. Other people create languages as moduses of uh, international communication. And there are so many other reasons people engage in this. So, you know, a conlanger could be anyone from, you know, someone like you or I who have done advanced degrees in linguistics and want to play with our, our linguistic theories a little bit and, and see what we can get to someone who has had absolutely no training in linguistics whatsoever, but they come up with these beautiful art languages that, that allow them to construct poetry or, or express themselves. And there's, there's no perfect mold that captures everyone. Great. Well, we'll come to the poetry maybe later. But uh, who is entitled? That's what I want to ask. Who is entitled to con conlanging? That's not um, primarily directed for or towards ling linguists, experts in language. Anyone can be a conlanger. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. I, I got an email from one person uh, yesterday saying, what prerequisites do I need to become a, a conlanger? Do you like language? Do you want to play with language? Congratulations, you're a conlanger. Start, start the trial and error process that we've all gone through. You don't, you don't need a degree in linguistics or a degree in language. You just need the interest and the passion to carry it through. Great. Uh, yeah, th tell me more about the Language Creation Society. You are a president of the Language Creation Society. And uh, as I assume, you receive lots of emails from people asking you about joining. What are the benefits of joining the Language Creation Society? Uh, so the Language Creation Society has been around for a little bit more than a decade now. Uh, it was the brainchild of a person named Sai. Um, who wanted to be able to host a language creation conference, recognizing there were people out there who engage in this, this hobby, this craft, and wanting to bring them together. And uh, it was an interesting loophole um, in California at the time, I can't remember which university they were attending. But if they registered as a club, then they could get university funds to potentially host this conference. Uh, the Language Creation Society really took off as just a vehicle to have a language creation conference every two years. Um, and we've, we've obviously grown a lot uh, over the last 13 or so years. Um, we've, we've helped HBO find conlangers for Game of Thrones. So David Peterson probably being the most well-known conlanger uh, and probably the only person who has ever made a living at conlanging in history. 
Um, but the, the society is several hundred members from around the world. It's run by the board of directors. And of course, I, I sit on that board. I elected that board and named president a couple of years ago. And I do get um, emails almost daily on somebody looking for an expert opinion, somebody looking to hire a conliner, or some people going, what is this thing? Or asking, or, do we offer scholarships? Um, all kinds of stuff. The primary benefit to becoming a member is um, we do offer discounts for some of our things like the Language Creation Conference, um, which is still sort of the backbone of what the society is. But we also connect people who are looking to hire a conlanger with people looking to be hired as conlangers uh, through our jobs postings, um, which we do offer to members first before they go to the public at large. Um, there's also email lists so you can connect with other conlangers and our, our email lists are quite active, um, whether it's just being hey, I just published this article. You guys might find it fascinating to how do serial verbs even work because I want to try and implement them into my constructed language. And uh, someone out there on our email list probably has a good idea of what serial verbs in Hmong is or something like that and can references or examples. And it, it, uh, it creates a great networking community so we can bounce ideas off of each other and uh, incredibly supportive. Uh, ideas don't get shot down. They might get questioned um, in an academic sense, but usually with the goal of, of building each other up, something I, I really appreciate about all of our members. That's, that's incredible. Um, I, we will talk probably about scholarships and conference a little bit later, but I want to ask you personally, how did you start uh, conlanging? How did you start creating languages? Uh, and has your linguistic background influenced that? Um, so when I was much, much younger and, and starting to play Dungeons and Dragons as a teenager, um, I decided, you know, my, my wizards needed arcane or my alien races or monstrous races needed to speak something. Um, and basically everything I made, some bastardized version of, of Gaelic or German or French. Um, and it was, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And I'm glad none of that survived. And then uh, during my master's degree at UCalgary, a friend of mine approached me in the hallway and he said, you speak Klingon, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> You're a Trekkie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge Trekkie. Could you do a talk on the linguistics of Klingon at the Calgary Comic and Entertainment Expo? I was like, um, went on Amazon. The grammar and dictionary was 99 cents. I'm like, yeah, I got this. Uh, I did that once. I didn't expect it to be a big deal, but People absolutely loved learning about the inner workings of Klingon. I loved researching it. And so I started doing more and more talks on Klingon. Uh, and then through the undergraduate linguistics club uh, verbatim, they asked me to do a workshop on how to invent a language. And you know, academically, I, I understood how one would do that. I had, I had been to a number of the what more well-known conlangs and understood generally how they were created so I started offering a couple of workshops and eventually I said you know if I'm going to teach this maybe I maybe I should try doing it and I started working on a language for a Dungeons and Dragons monstrous race called the Zill um, and I took into considerations they don't have lips so no bilabial sounds and they have large protruding tusks so I wanted something to play with that and I ended up creating what uh, what a lot of us call kitchen sink languages, where we go, ooh, this is cool, ooh, this is cool, ooh, this is cool, and just adding absolutely everything. So uh, since you're a phonetician, you'll appreciate that I had clicks and implosives and ejectives and contrasting oral vowels and nasal vowels and creaky voiced vowels, and it was just terrible. Uh, I remember the the copula, the verb to be in that language. Was, no, no. Okay. And I I had 
tried to contrast oral and nasal vowels, but uh, personally, I, I cannot produce an oral vowel after a click. So my, I, I have never produced the copula as it is supposed to be produced in that language. Um, and it's, it's a great example of what not to do. And I definitely learned what not to do from that uh, and tried again with, with several other languages, um, both personal and, and professionally. And yes, my linguistics training does play a huge role in the way I approach constructing a language. Um, my, my goal when I'm doing this is to make a, a language more naturalistic. So when I'm trying to figure out what the phonological system in the language should look like, I actually use Elon Drescher's contrastive hierarchy. So I work out all the phonological features of every phoneme in the language. And then I look at what are the natural aspects out of, out of what I've designed there and how would they interact? What phonological rules would change the pronunciation in certain combinations? Uh, I also use um, Martina Vilchko's universal spine hypothesis when I'm doing the syntax of my language um, that enables me to do some fun things, like maybe I don't want to use tense in a language, but uh, maybe I'll use a realis, irrealis system, and I can, I can use Martina Vilchko's universal spine to still make the language look natural, but create fun new contrasts with the language. Um, so I'm, I'm a very theoretical conlanger. I really enjoy playing with the background grammar and having the sketch, like, this is what would go into a paper to describe the grammar, and then I get to the stage where I have to invent some words and I kind of go, ah, can't I just with the grammar? Uh, <laughs> but it's all part of it. Um, but I know other people, they don't care about the theory. They just, they have this natural sense for how things flow, how things go together, what sounds good. And without any linguistic training, they're making these amazing languages. And I usually point to two conliners in particular, uh, Tony Harris and Jim Hopkins, um, who created the Alursa language and the Itlani language, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly, uh, respectively, and they're just, they're phenomenal, and these people aren't linguists, they're, they're not linguistically trained other than picking up books themselves, and um, they both fluently speak their languages and can have conversations with each other in each other's language, and it's, it's phenomenal what they've accomplished. I would ask you, what would you recommend to a beginner? My biggest recommendation is um, be prepared to fail, whatever they set their own goals for. Uh, I really think they should be willing to scrap whatever they come up with the first time or the first few times, because I think a lot of us are really disappointed by our, our first attempt at conlanging but we learn a lot from the experience and, and figure out how to march ahead pretty quickly. The second thing I would recommend is to lay out your goals for yourself. Um, people talk all the time about a conlang failing or a conlang failing. Um, so if, if one wanted to take um, a conlang like Itlani um, and say, how many speakers of Itlani are there? Um, I think there are actually a few now. There's uh, a, a pretty good Facebook following for this language, but definitely not the million plus speakers of Esperanto. And people might talk about a conlang failing because only a few people speak it. If the goal was never to have international communication or replace Mandarin or English or, or what have you, then that's not an accurate measure to evaluate a conlang by. Um, so you, you have to know what your own goals are and not let other people get you down. And the third thing is be willing to pick up a few grammars, be willing to go to Wikipedia, figure out what grammar is, what it looks like, what sort of questions should you be able to answer, um, and just, just have fun with it. Great. Um, you mentioned, uh, that some conlangs have followers. Why are, so to say, I, I don't know if this is correct, maybe it's subjective, uh, why are some conlangs more 
or let's say, let's put it this way, why are some column lengths um, more successful than other? Is there um, a reason to it? Successful, uh -huh. again, having the meaning uh -huh. of, of people speaking it in this instance. Um, perhaps one of the most successful by that measure, Conlang's, um, and I'm, I'm not including Esperanto in this or, or Volapük in this one, um, is, is Klingon. There are probably tens of thousands of people who have at least at one point tried to learn Klingon. Um, thousands of people using the Duolingo course to learn Klingon. Um, more people trying to learn Dothraki, or sorry, High Valyrian on Duolingo. Um, but we, we do actually have, you know, probably one or two, maybe 200 um, advanced speakers, um, somewhere between 20 and 70 fluent speakers of Klingon. Uh, there's been at least one child who has learned Klingon as a first language. And most people immediately assume that all of these people are huge Trekkie nerds. They watch the films, they fall in love with the franchise, and you know, some people go to conventions, some people cosplay. These people choose to interact with the franchise by learning an alien language. And that's not always the case. There are some very, very good Klingon speakers who have never watched Star Trek. I think the majority of them are Star Trek fans. Uh, that's certainly my vehicle into Klingon studies. But some people simply hear about the health benefits of learning a second language. Uh, it keeps the mind sharp. It, it might stave off things like dementia. Um, and they, they're up for a challenge. And on a whim, they decide to learn something that's more alien rather than more earthbound and practical perhaps and they they start with Klingon and they really excel at it because it is a full language it does have a speech community and you can engage with other Klingon speakers and I really think that's the key um, if I were to talk about um, my Tehosian language for example one of the onlines I've made uh, there are literally zero speakers of Tehosian. Uh, even in the fantasy world that that language was created for, it's already a dead language in, in that world too. And it only exists in, in manuscripts. Um, so there's, there's no community. Even if I did want to pick up my grammar and study it and become a speaker of, of Tehosian, the language I invented, I probably wouldn't succeed because I wouldn't have anyone to talk to. Klingon, Dothraki, High Valyrian, Natvi, um, Esperanto, these languages all have people who can share the language and can communicate. And other than it being cool for a particular in-group of people, I think the language community existing and being able to use the language is the, is the real key to success by that measure. Yeah, um, it's fascinating that there are entire worlds around languages and uh, we could see that uh, from the example of Klingon and Anthraki and uh, Navi is the language from the movie or for the movie Avatar, is that right? Just to clarify. So there are entire worlds around it but these were the languages that were created for a specific pur purpose. Yeah. How can a language be as successful as those languages if there is no specific show to be featured on or no community? Is that a possibility? Um, if there's no community, I would say the, the possibility is, is relatively low. Um, again, if, if that's what your measure of success is. Um, I'm trying not to get myself in trouble by by saying, you know, the, the old form of conlanging was auxiliary uh, language creation. It was yeah, what's the what's the difference between auxiliary languages and con con languages or constructed languages? Um, I I like to say that conlang or constructed languages, or people use the term uh, glossopoetics, 
is sort of this this high level overarching term and it's any language that's intentionally created by one or more people. Auxiliary languages or oxlanging is a branch of conlanging where the intended purpose is international communication. Art langing is a branch of conlanging where the intended purpose is to create something um, artistically, whether that's for a race in a TV show or a novel to speak or, or something personal. Heart langing is creating a language specifically for yourself. It's, it's your own world, your own refuge. Then we have things like edge langing, uh, where the purpose is some sort of experimentation or, or some other uh, specific purpose. Um, this is used in, in linguistic experimentation quite frequently. Um, and then there are other branches that other people would, would make. But I would suggest that art langing, which is what I do, and ox langing, which is the, the international communication, same thing, just different goals. And they're all, they're all forms of con langing. Why haven't those languages like Esperanto and Volapük and um, other languages that existed, why haven't they succeeded as international languages? Because they are, um, the intent of the authors was for these languages to be spoken by everybody in the world and to connect people in that way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Esperanto is perhaps the best example and, and a number of speakers, it's, it's probably the most successful of all time. Um, L. L. Zeminoff created Esperanto because he wanted a perfectly regular and um, by hypothesis, easy to learn, easy to understand language that everyone could speak and you could have a global community speaking the single language. And uh, he, he obviously a, a very brilliant um, person with, with grammar. Um, I don't believe he had any linguistic training whatsoever, but he was, he was reading a, a Russian grammar, if I remember correctly, and he, he happened to notice that there was a group of words that ended the same way and a different group of words that all end the same way. And, you know, what we would learn is, as declensions in linguistics or, or different uh, noun types or verb types. And he said, why do we have languages that differ from these obvious patterns? Why couldn't we make a language that just absolutely stuck to these patterns? And uh, he did, and he created Esperanto. And I, I believe there's a, a story where he had to create it twice because the first version got, uh, got destroyed on him. But uh, he, he created this perfectly regular language. So I want you to put yourself in, in his shoes. You've just created this absolute masterpiece of grammar. It's perfectly regular. All nouns end in the same vowel. All adjectives end in a different but unique vowel. All verbs follow a single pattern. And you go to your next door neighbor and you say, I've invented Esperanto. Do you want to learn it? It's going to be a language that everyone on the world can communicate in. It's perfectly regular and it's very easy to learn. And he goes, oh, that sounds really cool. How many people speak it? Well, I do. And after you learn it, you will too. And then we get some other people. Chances are that neighbor's going to go, mm, learning a language is a pretty big investment. Like that's a, that's a lot of time and energy come back when there's a few more people speaking it yeah obviously there are, there are people out there who go this sounds awesome i do want to learn it the, the esperanto um, language community is over a million strong we have people learning esperanto as their first language um, i know there are people at the university of calgary who do speak esperanto i'm not one of them um, but it's it it was remarkably successful despite all of those challenges of, of convincing people to speak another language. And, you know, in, in just normal society, if you go up to any given person on the street, no matter how you sell it, can you go up to someone and say, hey, I want you to learn French. I want you to learn Spanish. Like, why English? Mm. Um, yeah. and I, I suggest that most auxiliary languages face very similar problems, regardless of where they are. These languages, conlangs, they do not have 
or the authors of these languages, they do not have this intent of um, having a language for everyone to speak. There is um, something else in there, as you said, uh, and it's a remarkable exercise for the brain, for, for yourself. Uh, why are these conlangs such, such a good exercise for the brain? I want to backtrack to that issue because that's the main, uh, that's the main point. Yeah. So, you know, um, from a, a mental health perspective, um, or I shouldn't say we know, we, we have strong evidence to suggest from a mental health perspective that working with language is good for the brain. Uh, language is described by some people as a global process, meaning it uses both hemispheres of the brain. And learning a second language can have mental cognitive benefits, uh, we believe. We, we believe having more than one language can stave off dementia, it can keep the brain active into old age, things of, of that variety. And surely inventing your own language probably has similar effects. It, it engages the brain. But I think for a lot of us, when we're conlanging, we are actively rejecting the languages we speak to a certain degree. So when you're, you're sitting down, you could look and you could go, okay, my word for apple is going to be ibis, and my word for aardvark, aardvark is going to be alon, and my word for banana is going to be sisi, and my word for dog is going to be ob. You know, and you put that all together and you make a sentence using these words you just created, and if you follow the rules of English syntax, of English ordering, all you've done is, uh, I'll quote David J. Peterson, created the most annoying way to speak English possible. When we're conlanging, we're thinking of what is the grammar, what's, what's new, what's interesting about the way I'm putting this language together, what's interesting about the morphology, what's interesting about the sound sequences. Um, do we have things like um, one moose, two moose, three moose, but one dog, two dogs, three dogs? Or do we have a, a pockel number system or something we can do something else interesting with, um, you know, numbers of three or numbers of five or things like that? We're rejecting things like the word for ocean is just a word on its own, ocean, whereas in Old English it might have been a, a whale road, uh, a whale road. And, you know, we're coming up with these interesting compounds and we're rejecting, rejecting some of the assumptions we've made with our own language. Um, this gets a little sapir wharf for the, uh, the linguistically trained people. But uh, speaking another language can influence your perception, um, the way you treat things. So I think Klingon is a great example of this in... In English, you can love something or you can not love something. But in Klingon, to love something is to unhate it. And it's that opposite way of thinking. And a lot of the you know more positive, more friendly emotions that we would express in a natural language with their own word, Klingon uses this negation affix plus the the more pejorative form of the verb. So you, you unhate something to love it. Um, and it's, it's the wrapping your mind around a, a different philosophy, a different culture that, that really opens your mind to different possibilities. So I think that's, that's the direct answer to why is it a good thought experiment? Cause you're, you're pushing yourself to not be constrained by your own language and your own culture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Sapir Wharf. And in that, on that note, related to that, how, how do languages, constructed languages in particular, shape our point of view and vice versa? How do these languages shape the community as well, the society around these uh, around them. So of course, these are all, I believe, or 
fictional or invented societies, but still it is, um, it is something to think about when creating a language. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, again, I think David Peterson is, uh, is a master of this sort of thing. So he talks a lot about when he was inventing Dothraki, um, you know, these are, these are nomadic people, they're horse lords, their life tends to revolve around um, riding or, or horses in some variety. Um, I wish I had my, my fact page of, of Dothraki sayings up because I... Hashur Dothrai Chek. That's that, but Hashur Dothrai Chek is, uh, is how are you? But it literally means, how do you ride? You know, are, are you sitting well in the saddle kind of thing, uh, if, if the Dothraki used a saddle. Um, so a, a lot of the, the cultural and the, the idiomatic expressions in, in Dothraki have to do with uh, riding in some variety. Um, I, was, I shouldn't claim I was working on a translation in Dothraki. I was, I was asking David to do a, a translation into Dothraki, and um, we had a suggestion for it. So there's... Uh, very popular feminist uh, saying, nevertheless, she persisted. And it's, you know, it's a wonderful saying. And we wanted to render that into Dothraki um, for a title page in, in my girlfriend's dissertation, actually. And rather than persisting in some variety, which I, I don't believe there is a word to persist in the Dothraki language yet, uh, we suggested maybe the translation would be, nevertheless, she continues to ride. Mazin uh, which I probably also mispronounced, but it was nevertheless third person singular because there's no masculine or feminine in the Dothraki language uh, for grammatical gender. So nevertheless, third person singular rides. And it was, it was just such a beautiful translation and really revolved around the Dothraki horse riding culture. Yeah, and the, if I'm correct, um, staying on a horse is very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know any idioms surrounding that, but I'm sure they're there. Yeah, that, and that's exactly the point. Um, yeah, uh, you've watched The Office, I guess, the yeah. <laughs> American TV show when Dwight is teaching Erin to speak the Dothraki. And she um, says to him at one point, Dwight, I didn't know that you were teaching me a fake language. And he says, uh, people laugh the Klingon at first, but now you can major in it. And I think that's a, that's a good point, actually. And I have two questions in, with, this, uh, with this quote. I have two questions. Um, is constructed language a fake language first? And uh, can you major in it? Constructed language. Um, is it a <laughs> fake language? I guess that's a matter of definition. Um, is is art fake color? <laughs> like, it, it, is a painting fake color? Like, it's it's somebody's view of the world or of a situation or of a feeling that they, they crystallize, they put into form through whatever process they happen to use. And I, I don't think we would consider a painting fake. It may be not a perfect representation of a moment in time, but it's, it's not fake, it's art. And I think a, a constructed language is very much the same. It's, it's something drawn from someone's imagination from various forms of inspiration but once it's created or even while it's in the process of being created it's it's very real and it's um and I, I very frequently get asked why would you invent a language like why didn't you just you being the the general sense yeah. didn't George R. R. Martin or David Peterson or the showrunners teach, you know, Jason Momoa and Amelia Clark to speak Blackfoot or Navajo or something like that. Um, and it's like, would you ever say to, to the Beatles, oh, you've, you've written enough, we have enough music now, time to stop. You know, ACDC, thanks, but we've got enough music now. 
no, like we're going to continue making art because that's something that defines us as, as humans. We, we create and we don't want to misappropriate different cultures. Um, Mark Okrand, when he was flushing out, creating the, the Klingon language, he, he very easily could have used a Native American indigenous language. His doctoral research in linguistics was on indigenous languages in California. And he said, no, like Klingons are at that time, like they're the bad guys. Why would I try to associate an indigenous language with the bad guys and a, a culture that doesn't fit the language? And that's, that's exactly what we don't want to do. We don't want to repurpose, misappropriate someone's language for some other culture in a fantasy series. Um, so definition, Klingon, Dothraki, whatever it happens to be, um, is a, a fake language in, in the sense that it's not a natural occurring historically evolved from real speaking people's language, uh, but it's absolutely a real piece of art. Right. And can you ma major in it? Uh, oh. Is it? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, that would be fantastic if you could at some point. I know a lot of universities out there are starting to teach constructed languages, um, usually in a linguistics department. So it's, it's a really cool way to engage uh, undergraduate students with what linguistics is, because if they have to think about what the phonetic inventory of something is, they, they have to be open to the possibility of sounds that don't exist in their native languages. Uh, they have to be able to read the IPA chart. They have to know what sounds could feasibly go together or what rules they're breaking by putting sounds together that would not normally appear that way. They have to be able to know, you know, if you have object, subject, verb, syntax, um, the, the mailman, the dog bit, rather than the dog bit, the mailman, you have to carry that order throughout, uh, throughout your grammar and, and be consistent with whatever the natural way of speaking in your language is, uh, barring whatever exceptions you also create. Um, so you, a lot of universities are allowing linguistics and language degrees to be supplemented by a conlanging course. Um, there is a Klingon language institute where you can absolutely take courses in spoken and, and written Klingon. You can, you can become a fluent second language speaker. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of a program that would allow you to, to major in Klingon or major in constructed languages yet. Yes. Okay. That's good. Good to know. But it's it, it's exciting that uh, there are so many courses offered, and um, yeah, I will. I'm going to quote you now from uh, Twitter. Uh, the trend of conlang and Klingon being used in mainstream linguistic study is increasing, which is great to see because there is a lot we can learn with conlangs. Um, with I completely agree with you, but let's elaborate on that. How is how is the how is conlanging influencing mainstream linguistic uh, studies? Um, I've I've become aware over the last couple of years of quite a few graduate students doing both masters and and PhD research on constructed languages. Um, I know there is a, I believe, master's student at UBC, uh, University of British Columbia, Okanagan campus, uh, working with Christine Schreier, uh, who is a, a quite famous conlanger and linguistic anthropologist. And uh, this person is working on how conlang can improve mental health. So we're, we're looking at the, the mental health of people that engage in this craft. Uh, Christine and I had pitched a project. Unfortunately, we never got it off the ground, but we wanted to look at what communities of Na'vi speakers and Klingon speakers and Dothraki speakers use to perpetuate their language, um, which is, you know, their, their language societies are primarily digital. They're online. Could we offer some of those tools to help revitalize uh, Salishan languages or Algonquian languages? Um, 
and just, you know, see if that was something some of the Indigenous communities uh, wanted, and if so, what lessons could we learn from conlanging that could be applied to language revitalization. Uh, we also see a lot of conlangs used in acquisition studies. Um, so I like to I like to quote Lindsay Crax's master's thesis. Um, so maybe Calgary graduate student. Um, her master's thesis used Hungarian prime. Uh, so rather than trying to teach novice participants the Hungarian language, she created a simplified version of Hungarian, which would be an Englang, an engineered language and taught participants little pieces of this Hungarian prime to see how they were processing, how they were actually acquiring language. Um, we have other linguists who do things like they'll invent Martian and they will teach participants this Martian language to see what an English speaker does with an illicit consonant cluster or something like that. So we can do direct phonotactic testing, phonological or phonetic testing. Um, we, we look at stress patterns of artificial languages. Um, I, am, I am definitely not the only person to have done this. I believe uh, Joe Pater and a few other um, very, very good phonologists have looked at artificial stress patterns. I did a study a few years ago with Robin Stewart at Cove, who is the primary Klingon translator for Star Trek Discovery, where we analyzed um, the speech of seven advanced Klingon speakers. I think we got something like 320 tokens over a, a seven minute recording. And we compared what the dictionary says Klingon speakers should be doing with stress compared to what they're actually doing with stress. Uh, stress in Klingon is, is unnatural. It's, it's not like a natural human language. Um, and we wanted to know if they were being accurate at acquiring this non-human pattern. And they were performing at, at greater than 85% accuracy. So just showing us that it doesn't have to be completely natural as long as it's regular. Um, and we, we can learn these things. So there's, there's all this stuff going on with uh, linguistic and anthropological research using conlangs or about conlangs. Yeah, fun. Um... You, you said that um, you were teaching them to perceive, if I'm not wrong, uh, non-human patterns of stress of the most prominent part of the word. Let's put it like that. So um, is that similar to inventing like non-words and putting it into experiment, uh, which I'm also doing? Um, inventing non-words to test how the participants would perceive um, different stress patterns. Yeah, so one of the things you, you know, as linguists we want to do is we want to control for as many variables in our experiment as possible so we can find out if there's a change in the data, what's actually responsible for that change in the data. So you could if you wanted to test English, you could give English speaker that aren't real words, but could be words in English and see what they do with them. Um, the, I guess the most famous version of that is the WUG test. This is a WUG. Now there are two of them. Now there are two WUGs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that's nonce. That's, that's almost conlanging. That's on the verge of conlanging. Um, when I when I cite Lindsay Frax's master's thesis, um, if I remember correctly, I, I remember the I think the accusative case was Loth because I was one of the the participants in her experiment more than a decade ago. Um, she, if I remember correctly, she had two different patterns. Um, the subject of the sentence could be indicated by stress phonetically or by morphology, by indicating like a nominative or an accusative case. Um, there might have been a word order distinction in there. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. She wanted to find out if, if participants could learn this Hungarian prime more easily, the, the prominence patterns, the stress patterns, or the word order patterns. I hope I'm getting that right. 
Um, so she invented a completely regular version of Hungarian to take out all the other things that, that might have influenced what was going on and just those tiny details and doing nonce words like you're doing in your dissertation is, is just a different flavor of, of that. Yeah. Yeah, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, you've mentioned that there are certain rules that are consistent or applied in natural languages, but do you have to apply those rules in conlangs? And uh, I'm asking this specifically about phonological rules. What does this mean? Let's uh, describe it a little bit for our listeners. Um, the short answer to your question is you don't have to do anything in conlang, right? It's, it's art and uh, I love seeing people push the boundaries of, of what this art can do. Um, but specifically, if, if you're trying to make a naturalistic language um, and you want to do something phonologically speaking, language is, is really cool because just about anything that we can say, this is what natural language does, there's a language out there that breaks the rules. So we like to say there's, you know, almost every language on the planet has the sound t. Hawaiian doesn't have a T sound, doesn't have a T. Uh, there's what we call an implicational universal. If a language makes a contrast in voicing, chances are they will have the contrast between S and Z. Um, Irish makes a contrast in voicing and it doesn't have a Z. Um, chances are like if, if you're going to head the syllable um, whatever your head or your nucleus of a syllable is, is going to be a very sonorant sound. So there's a very loud, a very um, rhythmic sound, like a vowel. And if you go away from vowel, vowels, we can have things like er or ol in English, head syllables, um, syllabic consonants. But then you get a language like Blackfoot where you can have s be the nucleus of a syllable. So languages break the mold all the time. When we talk about break, breaking these linguistic tendencies for a language like Klingon, which is designed to be as non-human as possible, we, we take the rarest, or Mark Okrand took some of the rarest things and combined them in relatively novel ways. So you were just explaining what subject, object was by, by what nominative or accusative is. We like to categorize their languages in terms of the order of a subject, the thing doing the action, the action itself, and an object, the thing having the action done to it. So English is a subject verb object language, dog bit the mailman. It turns out that English is like, uh, if we're correctly, about 40% of the languages out there has that pattern. Um, subject, object, verb, the dog mailman bit, uh, if I remember correctly, again, uh, is like Japanese, and that's a slightly higher percentage, around 43% of those languages. Uh, Gaelic languages, bit the male, or bit the dog, the mailman, verb, subject, object. That's 9% of the world's languages follow that pattern, and then obviously you go down from the rarest order, and we don't know if it's actually attested in any world's language. Uh, simply because the languages that show us object, verb, subject also allow other orders, so we're not entirely sure. Less than 1% of the world's languages, less than 1% of the 7,000 or so languages spoken in the world allow the order object, verb, subject. Klingon is object, verb, subject. Um, the sound uh, is found in, I, I believe, five languages around the Balkans. Uh, so it's a very, very rare sound in any of Earth's languages. Uh, the sound kla is found in eight North American indigenous languages, and that's it. Klingon has both of those sounds, and they can occur in the same word. So it is, you know, you've, you've got this European sound that's incredibly rare, and you've got this North American sound that's incredibly rare, and in no language in the world that we know of do these two languages co-occur they co-occur in Klingon. 
Uh, so it's, it's breaking those kind of tendencies or expectations. Yeah, but in a way you need to start with somewhere. There is no way that you can escape that mold of a, a language, any language in this world. So if I would like to invent a system or a language, I would probably start with somewhere. Is that right? For example, I would start with like uh, Tolkien started with Finnish, I think, and um, uh, Welsh, if I'm not wrong, or he has yeah. Elvish languages. Yeah, uh, a lot of conlangers are influenced by natural languages. Uh, I'm working on a, a series of languages for an author out of the United States right now. Um, an Elvish language and, language and uh, a blend of Elvish with Middle German, actually. Mm -hmm. And he suggested that he wanted the Orc language to be similar in some regards to Eastern European or Slavic languages. He wanted the Elvish languages to have something in common with Celtic languages and, and go from there. But uh, when I do this, I, I don't go, oh, okay, the, the word for fog in Russian is ngwa, uh, and go, oh, this is going to be my word and I'm going to change it in very particular ways. I look at the system and I go, what characterizes Slavic languages? And I, I think one of my favorite things about Slavic languages is this palatalization distinction in the sound. So you could contrast sa versus tsia uh, as, as two contrastive sounds. And, you know, I, I build that kind of flavor into my language. But then if I look and go, um, you know, uh, Russian is a very case heavy language. So you can have nominative case for the subject of the sentence, accusative case for the object of the sentence, dative case if you're going towards something, instrumental case if you're using something and so on and so forth. Uh, this gives Russian a, a fairly free word order if I understand it correctly, or at least a lot of poetic licensing. Maybe I don't want to do that with the language I'm inventing. So I, I very purposely steer away from that. Uh, and the same is true when he asked me to create a, a Celtic sounding language, um, you know, verb initial with initial mutations. Um, so uh, fish the dog, the mailman, word order, and um, a mailman might have some consonant change compared to just mailman on its own or, or something like that. But I, I specifically sought out to go, okay, he wants it Celtic sounding, so that flow should be there, but let's make it distinctly non-Irish in the way I do this. Um, and this is my perspective as someone whose goal is to make naturalistic conlangs. There are other conlangers out there who are experimenting in, in every way, shape, or form. Um, Sai and Alex Fink, who is a, a Calgarian who lives in the UK, he's a professor of mathematics in the UK, they have collectively invented a gripping language. So the way you position your hands while you're holding hands with each other can actually be a way of speaking. And I, I don't believe they, they base that in any way, shape or form on things like American Sign Language or, or German Sign Language or anything like that. Um, they're also interested in, in nonlinear languages, in a language that might be expressed by, by smells or by tastes. There was another conlanger, and this is before I, I joined the Language Creation Society, who experimented with these, these 3D morphs that would change shape and I believe change color. And that was the system for, for their language. And we see people putting these new spins on it. Um, uh, I, Jack Bradley is his name. I, I can only remember his Klingon name for a second. Is a conlanger currently doing a, I believe, Master of Fine Arts degree in the, the United States. And he's looking at subway maps as a modus of communications. And if you indicated what stop you were on or what direction you were going on, I don't understand his language yet. I think he's still working on it, but you could get different interpretations based on those things. So you don't have to start with a natural language, which is one of the really cool things and, and really solidifies conlanging as an art. Oh, fascinating, really. Um, you've, uh, you 
invented a couple of your own languages. One is, if I'm pronouncing well, Tejuas. Tejuas. Tejuas, okay. And uh, the other, another one is Dala, no? Yeah, Dala is uh, one I've, I've just started working on. I've, I've only been working on it for a, a few weeks now. Great. And there is uh, something that I've noticed that's called Luxembourg, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Luxembourg. Luxembourg. I don't know. Oh, Luxembourg. Yes. Luxembourg. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe. Lexicon plus December. Luxembourg. Okay. Okay. That, that makes sense. So what do you do during that period? Um, and uh, is, I mean, that's an activity that many conlangers participate in. Tell us something more about that. I'm really not familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember who started this and when. I, I believe it was uh, Pete Bleakley, uh, Blakely, and um, and the conlanger whose name escapes me, unfortunately. And they came up with this idea that um, you would choose one or more of your constructed languages, and you would invent a new word for that conlang every day during the month of December. Uh, and many of us post to Twitter or Facebook or, or blog sites and use the hashtag, hashtag Lecember, Lecember. Um, And some of us engage in, with this in, in different ways. There's a lot of conlangers who partake. Um, for me personally, I'll, I'll come up with one word per day for, for one or two of my constructed languages. And I really like to give a history or a context and put some flavor into the world um, and into the word itself. Other people just, here's the, here's the word of the day. Um, other people, Margaret Ransdale Green comes to mind. Um, she's a linguistics graduate student in Hawaii and a, a brilliant conlanger. She composes music um, with, with her partner who is a, a composer and a musician but in her conlangs and performs them, just amazing. Uh, she'll invent a new word, she'll give the semantic class of that word, and she'll use it in a sentence uh, every day. And she mm. and, and potentially very few others engage in um, Lexstream, which is a new mm -hmm. every single day of the year. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's 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 pretty big for for us conlanging nerds. Um, just it's an excuse to expand our vocabularies. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a nice segue into what you do at the Language Creation Society and beyond. Um, you also, as you said, you organize conferences, and on these conferences, uh, what what do you discuss? Uh, are I, my impression is that there are some really well researched papers there that are being discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really open. Um, the original idea is, was just to, to bring conlangers together because we're this group of people that tend most times of the year to only interact via the internet. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's not usually a lot of conlangers in any one area. Um, that's obviously not the case across the board, excuse me, across the board. Um, there are a number of conlangers in Southern California and there is a club there where they get together on occasion. Um, there used to be um, one in, I think it was Philadelphia, though the organizer has recently moved to Halifax but the language creation conference brings conlangers together in one spot for a weekend. So we can hang out, we can nerd out, um, we can enjoy company and, and have conlangy discussions. Um, so the most recent language creation conference was last summer, summer in Cambridge, UK. The local host, host was Bettina Betnoff, uh, a, a really good academic from Cambridge University who is currently studying uh, perceptions of conlang sounds. So if you hear one language spoken and the, the conlanger assumed this was the particular culture's reason that, um, did they actively get that across in their phonotactics and their sounds in the conlang? 
Um, but we had a number of different categories for talks at that conference. Uh, we had a poster session. So um, Eric Barker, who is uh, Margaret Ransdell Green's partner, discussed instruments he invented for this fantasy world and, and produced with the synthesizer um, for composing music for these constructed language songs. Um, Deshto, uh, Jack Bradley, uh, had written a book of Klingon poetry, original poetry, and he was showcasing some of his Klingon poetry there uh, at the poster session, uh, and there were a few others. Then we have lightning talks where we allocate about a 15 minute slot if somebody just wants to do a talk on their conlang or in their conlang. Um, so they get to showcase some of their skills, some of their creativity. The next talk up from that is about a half an hour length, including questions. And these talks usually have some flair of a how to, or you might want to consider X. Uh, so we talk about um, semantic categories or somebody might take, talk about using culture to influence your conlang or someone might talk about their experience with creating a conlang for a TV show. Um, and then we have only maybe two or three talks for the entire conference, our full hour talks. And these are ones that are gonna get either theory heavy or um, reflection heavy. So our vice president for the Language Creation Society um, did a, a residency in Spain uh, working with other linguists there and, and speci specifically looking or adding um, the perspective of, of a conlanger. And we asked him to come and do uh, one of the one hour talks at the last conference just on his experience with working with other linguists, other language enthusiasts and, and talking about sort of the history and the, the pathogenesis of, of conlanging. Um, I've done some of the longer talks specifically on getting into Elon Drescher's contrastive hierarchy and how I use that in my conlang and things like that. And then of course we have just social events. We go to the pub and we nerd out. And we find out how many real or constructed languages we can yell cheers in. No, it sounds fun. Uh, how are you, if I may ask, how do you fund this? Uh, what is your funding resource? Um, so a lot of our funds come from uh, memberships. So we do charge for memberships, uh, two levels, both student and non-student uh, memberships. Um, so we, we do save up those funds. We have an Amazon Smile account. So through Amazon.com, people can choose to donate a portion of their purchases mm -hmm. to the Language Creation Society. Um, we do have a, a few other venues. We do look for grants. Um, so I can say that when we had the language creation conference here in Calgary in 2017, uh, we were very fortunate to receive funding from the Graduate Students Association and from the School of Languages, Linguistics, Literatures and Cultures. Um, so we were able to offset some of the costs. And then of course there is a, a registration fee, uh, which is cheaper if you're a member. Yeah, because it does um, cost to go to the UK, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, flights and things like that are up to the individual. Uh, this is why we like to try and bounce around between continents. So we had it in Calgary in 2017. We had it in the UK in 2019. Uh, chances are in 2021, it'll be somewhere in the Americas. Um, just trying to make it easier for people to attend at least one conference but we also live stream so that people can, can see from all over the world. Yeah, and you offer some scholarships, if I'm uh, correct. Uh, we have just announced a scholarship program. Um, I'm, I'm very happy because this is one of the things I've been trying to do for, for a while now. So we just awarded two scholarships. We're going to continue to award two scholarships annually. And this isn't to get to the conference, but this is for actual academic work on constructed languages. Um, so yourself doing something with nonce words or someone like uh, Lindsay who invented an engineered language and wants to do testing of this. Jack Bradley, who is doing his Master of Fine Arts on you know, using 
subway systems as a language or the other graduate student, and I, I hate it that I, I can't remember her name from uh, University of British Columbia, who's looking at using this within society, um, doing work with or on constructed languages is what we're trying to fund through for, through these two scholarships that we're, we're going to start awarding annually. Great. And who is eligible for these? Um, How do you apply, for example? So the, the scholarship deadline is in December of every year. It requires a, a quick summary of what your research is and how it connects with conlanging as well as uh, one letter of reference from someone, uh, whether that be a, a supervisor or a colleague. Um, it cannot be used just to invent a language. Many of us are doing that for free as it is. Uh, so we don't want to pay someone for inventing their own personal language. Um, it does require academic affiliation, which could be a high school. If we have a high school student, it could be a university, you could be a professor, you could be a student. You could be offering a workshop on how to, con how to do conlanging, or you could be doing a study like mental health and conlanging as we've seen out of UBC, or pushing the boundaries of fine arts through conlanging uh, that we saw from, from Jack Bradley. And uh, it, it really is intended to engage the academy in some way in conlanging rather than uh, further the arts necessarily. Um, so we're, we're just trying to open the doors to engage a different group of people through this scholarship. Awesome, really. Um, yeah, I want to ask you uh, for the end of this spoken word program, uh, what is the future of conlanging? What do you think? Yeah, I know we are living in um, unprecedented times. It's nothing is uh, really set in stone, but what is the future of conlanging? What do you think? Uh, my, my personal belief is thanks to a few very forward thinking producers and directors in Hollywood and, and that sort of industry, we're going to see more and more conlangs. Um, I know a lot of you know, beginning authors writing novels are reaching out to Language Creation Society to, to get hire someone to create a language for the novel because they see things like Klingon, like Dothraki, like Sindarin, um, the Black Speech or anything like that from Tolkien and they feel that this is a valuable thing to add, like I, I like to say, verisimilitude to their world. It, it makes their world real. It makes their characters real. And thanks to some excellent work by people like Marco Brand, Trent Pearson, David J. Peterson, Christine Schreier, we're seeing more and more conlangs in popular media. Um, the movie Alpha came out a couple of years ago and, and it was a Cro-Magnum was a conlang that Christine Schreier did. And the entire movie was nothing but that conlang. Brilliant, brilliant work. Uh, hearing Khal Drogo, uh, Jason Momoa speak Dothraki really impassionately. Um, you wouldn't have that performance if he was trying to do it in English. And the more and more producers and directors that are realizing this, they're bringing conlanging into the mainstream. They're making it popular. They're making it, I, th I think we're just shy of making it an essential component of these fantasy worlds. So I think the future of conlanging is, is going to be this popularization and seeing more and more of it. If you were to ask David Peterson what the future of conlanging is, and I, I feel it's very important to include what I think he would answer is, he would say, you know, conlanging is at least 800 years old. Um, we had uh, St. Hilde, the God von Bingen, Bingen uh, conlanging in the, in the 1200s. And we're still in our infancy. We're still seeing where we can push this art. And I, I think he would say, like you saw a transition from realism to abstractionist painting to, um, you know, just completely out there forms of artwork that we see in other media. 
he would suggest we're only starting to see what we can do with constructed languages and we're going to find new ways to push the boundaries of it as an art. Um, I, I don't know what that looks like because if I did, maybe I would be making it. But I, I think he's absolutely right. We're going to see new, brilliantly creative takes on, on what a language can be. Great. Um, how proficient are you in Klingon? Um, I, I, I have to look everything up still. I'm reasonably good at translating. I, I tend to post my translations to the Learn Klingon Facebook group to make sure I'm doing it right or, or to get uh, corrections if I'm doing it wrong, uh, typically with like embedded clauses and things like that. But I, I like to think I'm, I'm fairly proficient in reading it once it's written down. I can get the, the sounds right and I can translate fairly accurately. I'm asking this because um, I wanted to ask you what is your favorite expression from Klingon or from any other constructed language? We can finish with some quotes that you like. Yeah, so I, yeah, um, I, I put a lot of thought into it. And one of the first things that, that came to mind was um, in season three of Game of Thrones, there's this amazing reveal where Amelia Clark uh, says something like, Valerio Muno Engos Nuisisa. You know, Valerian is my mother tongue. And it was like, oh, yes. And then I started thinking of other things that Amelia Clark and, and uh, Jason Momoa had in, in Dothraki when they were speaking and, and season one. And this might require a little explanation because it's incredibly nerdy. But uh, Khal Drogo, uh, Jason Momoa says, um, Sofosor naka she havasi kazka. The earth ends at the Black Sea, and uh, Daenerys, uh, played by Amelia Clark, responds with something like, Sofosor um, nako vasechi. And uh, the, the, the earth never ends, and I'll get you to focus on that word, Sofosor, uh, earth. Because she then goes on to say, Sani sorfi veka yome, sorfe athiolariani. I'm probably butchering the Dothraki here, but um, that very similar worth, word, so fosor, earth, becomes sorfo, um, dirt. So she actually says, There are many dirts across the sea, uh, the dirts of my birth. And Jason Momoa looks over his shoulder in the scene and he says, Fosorfo. Raishi, not dirts, lands. And he actually corrects Daenerys's grammar. So mm -hmm. she's the, the land where I was born, not the, the dirt where I was born. And it was at that moment, I was like, this is brilliant. We're having a discussion about grammar of a constructed language in a constructed language. And the reason that this is one of my favorite back and forths in a constructed language of all time is because when I was quite young, um, so back in the, the 1980s when Star Trek The Next Generation was airing, I came out with a VCR board game, a VHS board game, and uh, the actor who played uh, Gowron, a Klingon, played uh, Commander Kavak, I think his name was, and he stole the Enterprise, and it was your job as the person playing this board game to get the, the Enterprise back. And one of the first things he does is he says something like, Klingon hol dasata a, uh, which is, we call this paramount hol, or paramount language. Terrible, terrible Klingon, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, but he tried to say, Klingon hol a, do you speak Klingon? And I remember being this, I don't know what, eight, 10 year old uh, boy, where I was like, this is amazing. Klingon is a language you could speak. And for whatever reason, as I grew up, I, I always remember the phrase, is this seat taken? And, and later when I could learn Klingon, like this was amazing. And the idea that you could have conversations about your language in this constructed language was phenomenal. And the reason I say that, finally getting to the answer to your question was, Two phrases out of Klingon are probably my favorite things of all time. The first one is 
Hol yichu, light the fire. And this was a phrase that they said in, I, I think it was the very first episode of season one of Star Trek Discovery. And when I, I heard Tukovma making this speech and he said, Kul yichu, light, light the fire. It's an imperative command to the, the torchbearer. Without subtitles, I, I understood that. And this was amazing to me that I actually understood the Klingon on screen. And I looked over and my girlfriend had this look of recognition. And I'm like, this is amazing. How does, how does she realize what's going on? And I, I think it's because one of the original series Star Trek movies, um, one of the first things you hear in Klingon in that movie is, uh, this is for Lloyd's Klingon character. Uh, saying activate the transport beam and later in the movie William Shatner as as Captain Kirk grabs the Klingon communicator and he screams Joel Yichu beam me up essentially and the second time they say that there was no subtitles mm -hmm. and, and Mark Okrand likes to tell the story where he was in the theater for for this being released and he's like this is the moment this is looking around and Klingon has spoken and everyone's like yes without the subtitles it's like, it works it's a great con line and joel you in the original and cool you in the new one it just had that continuity and that recognition factor i thought that was so brilliantly done and shortly after that they come up with a new chant in klingon which is klingon mach tach judge and we've always had sort of the the klingon idiom klingon mach we are klingon but then to add tach jaj, uh, which is the verb to continue, tach, and um, it's a, a type nine suffix, jaj, may or, or let it be. Um, and I, I thought this was just so brilliant that you've expanded an idiom from we are Klingon to Klingon mach tach jaj, remain Klingon. And it's not that tach jaj was a new word, the, uh, the type of Klingon imperial an anthem is tach jaj bo, uh, may, the, may the empire persist or continue or endure. And to repurpose this, this endure thing or may it continue into remain and blend it into an idiom that just became this, this unifying battle cry for the Klingon people. Um, I thought it was just the most amazing bit of, of both writing and translation work. It's something so simple, something incredibly nerdy, um, but I absolutely love it. No, it's a, it's a great story. It um, kind of touches upon the creativity that you can do with these conlangs and what you were saying about poetry, that you can have poetry in those languages. And poetry is... Uh, at least in my opinion, really not uh, translatable. So you cannot tr translate poetry into another language as successfully as something else. So that- I have to say, um, if, if your, your video recording of this goes to YouTube, it might be interesting. Maybe for a radio it's not, but uh, there are books of Klingon poetry. Um, this is, the book that uh, Deshtu, uh, Jack Bradley wrote, he gave me a copy of his own original Klingon poetry. Nice. So it's, it's, it's evolved enough as a language to allow a person to be that creative in it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I don't have a, a favorite expression that is, uh, let's say, so deep or profound as you have uh, because of the backstory. Um, I think there is one where they say the elvish people, that is the elves, when they are fighting, they say, like, go, go kiss an orc. <laughs> that's, that's their saying. I don't want to butcher the language, so, but, but uh, that's one of, the, one, one of my uh, favorite expressions <laughs> because uh, it's, it's, so, it's so, so nice uh, and to so have that. Enriched. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you understand it, you get it immediately. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for being a part of this podcast. Oh, thanks so much for, for thinking of me and, and thinking of, of conlanging as a, as a topic that you assume people will enjoy. I hope so, for sure. I, I think they will. And I know that we could uh, talk about this 
that this you could talk about this for for a very long time and we might have a a second edition of this <laughs> who knows but thank you yeah no thank you so much